This week, we're at the biggest show on Earth. There will be robots, poetry, and the biggest screen you've ever seen. Ladies and gents, this is the moment you've waited for. In the heat of Dubai, your sweat soaking through the floor. Yes, it's a year later than planned, but it's finally on. World Expo 2020 has opened its doors and we're finally on the ground to see the spectacle. Dubai has turned an enormous section of desert into an event where nearly every country under the sun gets to wave its flag and show off its ideas on a world stage. The hype has been huge, so it's time to see if it's lived up to its promise. Time to find out if this is the greatest show. 192 countries, 192 pavilions, all different, some extravagant, some just bonkers, and maybe, just maybe, some world-changing ideas hidden amongst them. Who knows, maybe it's the robot helpers delivering food, giving directions and... Excuse me, I'm in charge of the security here. Please let me through. Keeping order. Maybe it's the giant displays, some of the biggest and boldest I've ever seen. Is it the architecture itself, hinting at new ways that we could live and work as we motor on into the 21st century? From the Great Exhibition in Crystal Palace in London in 1851, through Paris's Eiffel Tower in 1889, Brussels' Atomium in 1958, and Seattle's Space Needle in 62, these World Expos are meant to make a statement and leave a mark, a legacy for the host country. And this enormous Expo site will certainly do that, even if the exhibits themselves don't stand the test of time. The Sky Garden is a garden in the sky. Now, if you're tempted to ask, what is the point? I'd suggest you're missing the point. Really. In many ways, the show is all about the show. Each pavilion, a blank canvas for a country to paint itself as forward thinking and future facing. Uh, we believe we're doing this for uh, a bigger cause and especially during a time period of COVID where we've collectively as humanity faced all the challenges that we have and then to bring the world literally together in one place, in one city, this event uh, is something very important not only for the UAE but uh, for the world at large. This is more art than innovation, more concepts than creation. But anyway, it's time to get stuck into this great big noisy colourful event, one in which water cascades down into the desert and then at night, with the trick of the light, it cascades back up again. But bringing water into the desert is a bit of a metaphor for the times we live in. Sustainability is a big theme at the Expo, but will societies whose wealth and comfort have been built using fossil fuels really push hard to go green? Amongst all of the distinctive designs, one building does stand out as an oasis of green. This is the Singapore Pavilion, giving us a glimpse of how a city and nature can coexist. Now, Singapore is actually a pretty green place already. A lot of its buildings and bridges have an almost post-apocalyptic amount of greenery growing up them. And this takes that idea to the next level. Here, visitors are taken on a winding canopy walk through a vision of a vertical city garden, complete with concept robots that may one day travel around the buildings doing the gardening. This is one way that you do not need any man or human intervention or to, to monitor the plants, so it's supposed to go around the building, uh, high-rise uh, areas, where you can actually, through machine learning, identify the plant's growth, collect data, and also uh, in terms of the sensors or whether the environment or the plants are doing well or not. 
some of the lighting comes from solar tubes, basically big empty columns that channel the sunlight from the roof to the floors below. And the building itself is covered in 570 solar panels, which should provide all of the power it needs for things like the dry mist fans that they use instead of air conditioning, the LED lights and the irrigation system. That would actually provide enough power to power the entire pavilion for the six months. And with that solar energy harvested from the sun, we are doing desalination. We draw groundwater from the ground. Uh, the groundwater is saline in nature, so we have to do a desalination process, also powered by the solar energy. Uh, and the water that is desalinated is used to irrigate the plants, to water the plants, as well as for normal use uh, uh, for the pavilion. With 85% of the city-state's population living in high-rise public housing, this is a journey that Singapore has been on for a long time. And now it's trying its model out in a very different climate, the desert. The main problem out here is, of course, the lack of water. But over at the Czech Pavilion, they're making water from thin air. Or actually, capturing moisture from the air. You know these packs of silica gel, which you find in food and other types of packaging to keep the whole thing dry? Well, the researchers behind this project have redesigned and reformulated this stuff, and the new type of silica is capable of capturing moisture from even the driest air. Usually, for the condensation of water, if you have the electricity somewhere, you need humidity of the air higher than 66%. Our technology can produce water even from the air that is uh, uh, drier than 15% of humidity. The idea is to plonk a few of these solar-powered containers anywhere in the desert where you need to create a water source. So what you can see is the oasis that was created uh, thanks to the water we do produce from the air. We are speaking about like three gardens of this size. Now, Dubai actually has relatively high humidity and this one unit is producing about 800 litres a day. But we were told that even in very dry air it can produce around 100 litres a day. An additional system can add minerals to the water to make it drinkable, but the main point of this is to autonomously irrigate the soil below to cultivate the land and create greenery. If you have this technology in the middle of the desert where there's no infrastructure and where there's only very dry air, you can create or oasis or you can build the houses and you can uh, make the water potable for human beings. But when you put water into such fine desert sand, it drains away immediately. This green water, however, is infused with a special kind of algae that keeps things moist for longer, reducing the amount of water needed in the first place and also providing nutrients to help the plants grow. Water's amazing. But, of course, we shouldn't take it for granted. We are overfishing our seas, so here's an idea to try and prevent that. Different fish are apparently attracted to different coloured lights, and this LED fishing net uses this fact to target certain types of fish whilst repelling unwanted species. Makers Safety Net say its tech could reduce unintended catches by up to 90%. Meanwhile, over at the German pavilion, researchers from the Fraunhofer Institute have been looking at water for a different reason. One of the problems with renewable energy like wind or solar is how do you store it so you can use it when you need it, which might be when it's dark or not very windy. Now in the past we've seen excess electricity being used to pump water up a mountain so it can flow back down when you need the extra power boost or to send a train up a hill and it rolls back down when you need it. Well here's an idea from Germany where you use energy to pump water out of giant spheres which are under the sea to create a vacuum. And then when you need extra electricity you let the water back in, which turns a turbine, and you get your light bulb moment. The researchers hope these can be sunk under the water right next to ocean-based wind farms. Hello and welcome to the Week in Tech. 
It was the week that UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Microsoft founder Bill Gates struck a £400 million partnership to invest in green technology projects. Bitcoin reached a new all-time high of over $66,000 after starting the year below $29,000. And Donald Trump announced his new social media network, Truth Social. The former US president will now have his own online platform after being banned from Twitter and Facebook. In a press release, the Trump Media and Technology Group said it would fight back against the big tech companies of Silicon Valley. And one of those big tech companies of Silicon Valley may be headed for a major rebrand. According to tech site The Verge, Facebook will imminently be involved in a company name change. The Verge said it would reflect Mark Zuckerberg's focus on the metaverse and would be announced on or before the company's upcoming Connect conference on October 28th. Alibaba founder Jack Ma was spotted on the Spanish island of Mallorca with his super yacht Zen. It's the first time the billionaire has been seen outside of China since falling out with regulators in 2020. Robot cats were mobilized to help with one restaurant chain's waiter shortage in Japan. 2,000 of these cat-like bellabots will act as replacements for human staff. And finally, we end on more cat robot advancements this week, as MIT showed how its cheetah robot can negotiate uneven terrain with gaps and obstacles. The new system called TMIC, or Trajectory Modulation via Impulse Control, doesn't require pre-mapping of terrain, allowing the robot to travel anywhere. Welcome back to the World Expo 2020 in Dubai. Off to Italy now, where we pose the question, if Michelangelo had had a 3D printer, would he have bothered with all that sculpting? This is an exact replica of his David, which has been scanned in incredible detail to within a hundredth of a millimetre. The process took 40 hours, and the result was a 3D file that was then sent off to a massive 3D printer. And even then, the five metre tall statue had to be printed in acrylic resin in 14 different pieces, which were then glued together and covered in marble dust. Of course, now the data exists from the 3D scan. It's not a big leap to think that in the future anyone could download it and 3D print their own version of David. The data isn't being made available at the moment, though. It's being kept under wraps by the museum, I guess, as an insurance policy, just in case anything happens to the original. Now, here's the slight quirk. Most visitors only get to see David's top half, which is a really interesting view that you never normally get. Did you know, for example, that David's pupils were heart-shaped? But to protect his modesty, wide ledges stop you from seeing the downstairs department. However, downstairs there is a luxury lounge where special guests get to see the rest. Yes, only those at the bottom can appreciate the bottom. Only VIPs get to see the VIP. It's a humbling experience. Now then, would you believe that Dubai is hosting yet another eye popper of an event this week? And we sent Nick Quek to gaze upon its vastness. This year's biggest tech show, Jitex, has served up a messy platter of tech, with everything from virtual reality to artificial intelligence to wall-mounted lettuce. The stands are stacked with retail concepts aplenty. I'm going to be buying all of these. So underneath here is a small camera that's constantly taking photographs. And when I take an item off the shelf, an artificially intelligent algorithm on board the device recognises that object and adds it to my virtual cart. I can't think for the life of me why this completely seamless contraption wouldn't fly off the shelves. Did it work? No. Technology is actually woven into the fabric of our everyday lives. We have autonomous smart police stations. We've got government digital services. We even have a thriving digital art scene. Growth is exponential with digital and it's very important for the region and for the country. How we get around in the future is also a key theme this year. The vehicles here aren't just smart, they're sensitive. These individual spoilers aren't for aerodynamics. They're to let other drivers know how this car is feeling. 
Inspired by reptiles, this Mercedes concept car's skin moves like an animal's, with its back up, literally. But it's also in tune with how I'm feeling. Inside the cockpit replica, I'm able to control a video game purely with the power of thought. An EEG headset reads my brain activity, and when I think about a virtual button, it tells the computer my selection. And the government is honing in on this area as part of a wider push to attract foreign talent and grow its tech scene. True to form, it's kicking off an international competition next week. We are looking to create 1,000 digital companies. We are looking to attract 100,000 coders and programmers to be here over in the next five years. We are looking to double the digital economy, you know, by 100% to a good 200 billion economy here. If you look at all these initiatives, what it points to is the desire, the ambition, and the humility to want to constantly upgrade, to keep ahead. And Dubai is becoming an alluring player. Human in Motion Robotics has travelled from Canada to show off its invention. Five years ago, I suffered a spinal cord injury and doctors told me I would never walk again. But today, I can tell you on this world stage that I am walking again. The people who told me that forgot about technology. It's not only just health and wellness of being upright and moving, but it's also the mental health for people of being eye to eye with peers again. To be able to hug my husband to my chest, this changes my life. Getting people around safely is on the nation's agenda. The Road Traffic Authority is smartening up its cycle lanes. The camera that we have it installed in Nadu Shiba can detect if a cyclist is wearing a helmet or not. Also, we can detect the occupancy of the uh, cycling track. So if we have an increased number of cyclists, we can send an alert to uh, related uh, government entities for a faster action in case of any emergency. Of course, innovating is one thing, but in the heat of the desert, I haven't personally seen any cyclists. And whilst this trade show is getting bigger, it may be a while before this place becomes the industry magnet it's aspiring to be. That was Nick. And with Jitex and the World Expo both on this year, Dubai certainly has tried to put itself at the centre of the tech world. Many of the country pavilions here are stunning, although it's good to remember that this show is more about ideas than invention. A chance for a nation to promote its values and its visions. So I was a bit nervous to see how the UK had chosen to represent itself. I shouldn't have worried. Not a red telephone box in sight. This is a building that embodies an idea from one of our greatest minds, Stephen Hawking. The days of a thousand photographs. No one thought we could actually talk to water. It's like looking out the window on a starship. At first, we were trying to make in relations by feeding our fangs. What? Now turning to foods in the shape of letters. That's alphabetic spaghetti, isn't it? Hmm, profound. This is poetry generated by an artificial intelligence and inspired by Professor Hawking's project to find a universal message that we could send into space in an effort to contact alien life. To learn what kind of phrases go where, the AI was trained on thousands of actual poems and it then creates new verses from words donated by the pavilion's thousands of visitors who make their way up the winding ramp to the top. You can tell this is the UK pavilion because they built in a massive queuing system. Time to add my own genius to the masterpiece. Oh, I'm so original. And then your donation is taken into the structure where you can watch it being absorbed into the walls accompanied by a soundtrack of international voices and sounds all playing in harmony. 
Samir Hashmi is the BBC's Middle East business correspondent and you are based in Dubai. This is your patch. Thank you for having us. Well, good to have you here, Spencer. The team and you are here. And yes, we are here at the UAE Pavilion. I know, and it's no surprise really that it is the most spectacular of all of them. Yeah, it's the biggest, it's the largest. And uh, what you see, uh, the design of this pavilion is actually a falcon, the bird in a flight because that's the main, uh, main bird of the country. Yeah. So it really reflects the journey of this country from the desert uh, to where they are right now. What should we expect from these kind of world fairs? Should we expect the next big invention or is it more about countries posturing? It's more about posturing. Really, I think the UAE is very clear that they were not expecting one big idea to come out of the expo, which we have seen in the past, right? And the fact that this would be the first or one of the first big in-person events after COVID-19 gives them a great opportunity to showcase the world, this new world we live in. What happens to this site after the expo? Uh, well, the plan is that 80% of the site, I'm not, not including the country pavilions, but the rest of the site, uh, will remain in place. Some of them will be converted into science museums. The main exhibition center will be kind of where, uh, is where they're planning to host all the major events going ahead, which used to take place in the heart of the city. Jitex, which is taking place at the main exhibition center. They're hoping that these events would move here over the next few years. Well, Samir, thanks for having us to your place and uh, we'll see you again soon. Yeah, great to have you here. When the sun goes down, the expo really comes to life. At the heart of the action, the El Wassel Dome. And if there is an Eiffel Tower of Expo 2020, this is it. I found myself saying this a lot when I've been in Dubai, but honestly, this is the greatest projection I've ever seen. By day, the dome is a beautiful semi-shaded structure, but the extraordinary performances after dark are where the magic really happens. And it's all driven by the team in the control room. Those are the, the biggest projectors I've seen in my life. The 252 40K projectors that provide the projection. If we want to get into the numbers, 27,000 pixels by just over 5,500. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So we've got 42 pods and um, each of these pods houses six of the projectors, six layers of projection um, focused into the, into the dome. Each piece of video which makes up the patchwork in the sky is feathered at the edges so it all blends smoothly together. And Bill told me that not all of the graphics are pre-recorded in advance. They can actually make changes live, which sounds terrifying goes wrong very quickly um, so there's been a lot of testing um, of, of the sizes the shapes and the speed of how things move around it's a feast for the eyes and for the ears the sounds come from any and every direction around the circumference We've got 27 channels of audio plus 27. the one 27.1 surround sound that's it exactly <laughs> What you can't see is that this dome is made of lots of different shapes, lots of different circles and diamond and triangle and arch-shaped tiles. The images are being perfectly projected on some of those shapes, so they just perfectly match the circle or the arch. I mean, it really is faultless. Outrageous audacious and spectacular. The dome and the whole expo, really. I wasn't sure that a show like this could possibly live up to the hype, but I have to be honest, it really has to be seen to be believed. And I'm afraid to say that is it from the World Expo 2020. A year late, but worth the wait. Was it the greatest show on earth? It's the best I've seen in a while, I have to say. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.